Hi everyone, I'm Chris Howard and this is Top of Mind. This is the fourth episode in a conversation around generative AI that started a couple of months ago with a discussion about ChatGPT and has gone through design patterns and some around risk and regulation, use cases. And today what I want to talk about is how this technology follows what Gartner calls the hype cycle. The hype cycle begins with a technology trigger of some kind. So something happens that people start paying attention to, and then all of a sudden there's galvanized attention, very steep slope up to what is called the peak of inflated expectations. That's the point where this technology is everything, can do everything, solves all the problems that we've ever seen. And then you start to get a bit of a dose of reality. And what happens after the peak of inflated expectations is you then hit the trough of disillusionment. So reality sets in, you realize it's hard or it isn't all those things that we expected it to be. You know, there are risks associated that we didn't understand at first. And then that's where the real work begins. When you're in the trough of disillusionment, two things can happen. One is you give up. The second is you actually learn how to harness it. And if you do that, that's what's called the slope of enlightenment and then hit the plateau of productivity. I would contend that most of the clients that I'm talking to today that are experimenting with generative AI are in that trough of disillusionment, but working through it. So they're actually creating pilots, they're testing them, they're starting to create results and aiming it towards use cases that are either aimed at productivity, increased productivity or growth of some kind. So generative AI follows the hype cycle. We've just passed the peak of inflated expectations. Maybe some people are still there, but very quickly we're starting to realize what it is, what it isn't and how we harness it. One of the things that's happening in this trough of disillusionment is teasing apart the difference between generative AI and just regular AI. So generative AI, just as a reminder, is a type of technology that creates novel things from a base of learning. So in the case of ChatGPT, it was trained on billions of words and it gets very good at predicting word structures. So it appears to be having conversation with you. It's generating new conversation. It can be done with other materials too, like code or even chemistry or contractual language, anything that can be structured and then recombined. That's what generative AI really does. Regular AI includes all of the things related to machine learning, and probability and so on, but it's a much wider field. And so what's happening as we start to examine generative AI is become scoped a little more clearly. The next thing that's starting to happen right now is moving from these giant models like GPT and others into smaller, very domain specific or purpose created models that are aimed at a specific set of problems or a specific type of language or content or material to solve problems in different industries. And then ultimately what happens as we move towards the plateau of productivity, it becomes more a question of integration across these models for more complex use cases. Something else that's starting to catch people's attention right now is an older concept called artificial general intelligence or AGI. And this was something way back in the days of early artificial intelligence where the idea was, well, could we create compute that's actually equivalent in intelligence to humans and could actually solve problems that it hadn't been trained on and show some sense of logic or common sense or these types of, of traits. Now, part of the complexity with that is that we are not really sure how intelligence itself works. So it becomes a philosophical debate and not one that I'm gonna spend a lot of time on here. But because we're hearing about it, I thought it would be good to just talk about it for, for a minute. So AGI proposes that these types of compute environments can learn on their own in ways that they hadn't been taught. You have a chain of thought, you have logic, you have reasoning, you have the application perhaps of common sense. And what is happening right now is that the sophistication of these models gives the appearance that it is thinking to be determined whether it actually is or not. But there's some interesting experiments going on where you can actually combine different modalities and have it create, say, something like a proof of a theorem in the language of Shakespeare. And it combines its knowledge of the poetics of Shakespeare and rhythm and meter with the actual logic of the proof itself and creates a sonnet or something like that. Now that's pretty clever, right? How much of that is memory versus its understanding of the poetry language itself and then creating something together? What's very interesting though, is there's a big difference between chat 
3.5, ChatGPT 3.5, and GPT-4 in its ability to do these things. So it's caught the attention of the vendors, of the academics, also of Congress and of other political entities around the world that are figuring out how to manage this before it gets out of control. What I would say is that these models will continue to get smarter. Their emergent behavior will become more and more uncanny. And it is time actually to figure out, well, how do we put guardrails around that to ensure that we stay in control of this really sophisticated learning environment? If you watched the testimony on Capitol Hill a few weeks ago, you heard Senator Coons talk about something called constitutional AI. This is something that we're looking at at Gartner. I think it's a really interesting concept, but it's really new. The basic idea here is that you use AI to check the output of AI. And so you have an AI that is trained in a specific philosophy or a set of rules or policies or regulations or style of language. And it's actually checking the output from another generative AI system to ensure that it complies. And if it doesn't comply, it regenerates until it actually does comply. So a fairly sophisticated use of AI and AI working together that is an emerging field, I think is really exciting and may actually provide the control layer that we're looking for to make sure that we have guardrails around AI. So if you've been watching this series, you'll remember the first one of these, I talked about my great grandfather and cars in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia. Uh, and my mom was watching, and she threw in a little bit of extra detail for the story, and I thought I'd include it here. So you remember the story was my great-grandfather sees a car go by, one of the very first cars in the early part of the 20th century, and is a bit skeptical. What happens, though, you fast forward seven years, and he owns one. It's sitting in their front yard. The first person who learns how to drive that car is my grandmother. And then a few years after that, it was the first automobile-based postal delivery service in southwest Nova Scotia. So they replaced horses and sleighs and carts with a car that had, a, had an infrastructure to support it and used that to deliver the mail. So thanks, Mom. Thanks for listening. I appreciate it. So this has been Top of Mind. Join us in a couple of weeks' time where we'll move on maybe to another topic, but please put your feedback in the comments. I do read that, and if there are things that you would like to cover, I'm absolutely happy to do that. Thank you.